During this special four-part series, we have examined systemic racism, which is defined as policies and practices that exist throughout a whole society or organization, and that result in and support a continued unfair advantage to some people and unfair or harmful treatment of others based on race. Today, we'll address the racial inequities and structural racism that exist in our criminal justice system and education. It's a pleasure to be joined by Dr. Howard Fuller, who has served many years in the field of education. Now retired, Dr. Fuller has served as a distinguished professor of education and founder and director of the Institute for the Transformation of Learning at Marquette University. He has served as the superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools, and there's a public charter school named in his honor, the Dr. Howard Fuller Collegiate Academy. How are you, Dr. Fuller? Very good, Andrea. It's very good to talk to you. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. And right off the bat, along with your credentials, uh, you are described as a civil rights activist and education reform advocate. So in your opinion, um, how big of a role does systemic racism play in our education system? Well, I, I think you hit it when you gave the definition for systemic racism. I mean, what it means is that race plays a role in all of our institutions. And so when I used to teach, you know, I would teach about the major institutions in our society and the interrelationships between those institutions and then the particularity of each institution. So what it says is that if you believe as I do, that racism is fundamental to the way that America is organized, it's not possible for race not to be a factor in all of the various institutions that represent America, of which education is one. And so the way that you see it is in the data. You know, for example, when you look at the reading scores of Black children in the city of Milwaukee, and I've been looking at it for over 30 years, mm -hmm. and when you see that gap that has been constant between Black children and white children, you're left with two issues. Does it mean that black children are genetically incapable of learning or learning how to read? Or is this something that is built into our system that negatively affects black children? And I believe that is the fact, not that we're genetically incapable of reading. Absolutely. So statistics show that the opportunity gap between white students and students of color actually opens up before they even start school. So on average, you have children of color who are born into households uh, with fewer resources for food, Internet and books. And on top of that, they're also born in areas with underfunded schools. So could you talk about how that also plays a role in how our kids are educated? Andrea, I think what you've done is you put your finger on the, the, the reason why this is so difficult to discuss. Mm -hmm. Because what you just did was not only to describe the issues of race, you also factored in socioeconomic realities. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in this country is there's this intersection between race and class. And because disproportionately, people of color are part of the socioeconomic class that has the least resources available to them, you see those factors in like certain segments of the black community, for example. Mm -hmm. And so what it leads people to do is to give a racial definition to something that isn't fundamentally racist, it's fundamentally a factor of class in our society. And so what happens is you're trying to understand this intersection between race and class. And there are clearly certain things that happens in our communities because of race. Mm -hmm. And then there are certain things that happens in our community because people lack the material resources that they need to make their lives better. And so when you're doing this analysis, you've got to understand when is something racist and when is something that may look like it's racist, but it isn't racist. It has to do with people's economic wherewithal. Wow. Great way to break that down. And so with all of that said, in your opinion, what needs to be done in order to even the playing field, so to speak, when it comes to educating all children? Yeah, so this, this gets into like a discussion of something I'm going to give a speech on tomorrow. And it is wow. the difference between equity and equality. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Because in order to, to make a difference for our poorest children, a disproportionate number of whom are children of color, equality is not an answer. Because what equality does is to say, we're gonna assume that everybody is starting the race with the same possibilities. Whereas when you deal with the issues that particularly poor black children or poor brown children face, they're already starting the race with an anchor around their, uh, uh, their leg. And so mm -hmm. if you run a hundred yard dash and you stop it at 50 yards and you say, okay, what we're gonna do now is give you equal treatment. That won't work because you've had the anchor on the legs of the poor black and brown children. And so in order for it to be equal, you in essence have to give, you have to push them up to the point where other people are because they never had those impediments to start with. And so what equity demands is greater resources, more resources for the children who need it the most. And that isn't what happens in our society generally. Mm -hmm. And that's a great analogy because I envision a race and if uh, a person in one lane has a million hurdles to jump and the other person is just simply running with no hurdles, then uh, there is going to be a different outcome. So uh, you have founded a nonprofit, the Black Alliance for Educational Options, which that pretty much promotes school vouchers to enable low income children to attend private schools. When we look at uh, the history of vouchers and uh, charter schools, or choice schools, I should say, uh, there's been quite a bit of controversy. Can you tell us why you believe that is? Well, there should be, uh, because anytime you try to do something different, there's gonna be controversy. Mm -hmm. And so the way I would characterize what I believe in is slightly different than what you said. And so let me try to explain it real quickly. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I'm always saying to people that when you talk about the voucher program in Milwaukee, you have to recognize the work of Annette Polly Williams. And I believe, Andrea, and I think you and I may have talked about this before, we have. that I really am always pained by the fact that I don't think that Polly gets the credit that she should get for the courage that it took to take the stand that she took when she did. Having said that, I'm a supporter of parent choice, okay. not school choice. I'm a supporter of low income and working class parents having some of the same options that those of us with money have. Because in America, choice is not the issue. The issue is who has it and who doesn't. And so if you have money, going back to an earlier conversation we were having, and schools are not working for your children, you can move to communities where they do work you can put them in private schools, or you can get the most expensive tutoring on the planet. It's poor parents who don't have those options. So if schools are not working for their children, they can't just pick up and move. They don't have the money to put their kids in private schools or get tutoring. And so what I've always fought for is for low-income and working-class parents to have some of the aspects of choice that those of us with money have. And it's not possible for that to happen for poor people without support from the government. And so I support not just vouchers, but I've supported charter schools. I support home schools. I support choices within the traditional public school system. So for me, it has always been about giving poor parents a way to choose the best environment for their children in the same way that those of us with money have. And a very good example of this, quite honestly, Andrew, is what's happened with COVID. When all of a sudden you start hearing about these pandemic pods and, and all of this where people with resources were able to say, okay, if the school is not gonna open, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pool our resources and begin to hire our own teachers and create these educational pods. Poor people didn't have the ability to do that. And so all of a sudden you begin to see in real terms what it means for people who have the ability to exercise choice and people who don't. Yeah. That's absolutely true. So a few other examples of systemic racism I'd like to uh, bring out and you can give your thoughts on it. Uh, the disproportionate pathologizing of children of color compared to white children. So uh, in many instances, um, you see black students who are suspended 
at higher rates than white students. And then when looking at the national statistics, 70% of the students arrested in schools and referred uh, to law enforcement are black, which I believe uh, goes hand in hand with the school to prison pipeline. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, again, the problem with having these discussions is that we have a few minutes to talk broadly as mm -hmm. if we can broadly explain everything, right? Right. But in reality, it really gets into the particularities of the situation. Yeah. But, but but what I, what I would say is this. I, I really think, the, the, the for me, the school of prison pipeline actually begins where we don't teach kids how to read. And mm. so, so for example, if you were to examine, and I've seen some studies about this, about who is really in prison, like we know in Wisconsin, for example, we have the highest incarceration rate of Black people in the United States of America. Yes. And the data is very clear on this. But if you were to go in and do an analysis of the educational attainment of a significant number of those Black people who are in prison, you will see, if not a causal relationship, a correlation between the lack of education and ending up in prison. And so although people talk about suspensions as the beginning of the, the, the school of prison pipeline, to me, it's not teaching kids how to read. Because if you don't, if you're not able to read by the time you're in third grade, your chances of, of, of graduating from high school are diminished considerably. Mm -hmm. And so while I understand the connection that people make between suspensions and prison, and I don't support just suspending kids for any reason at all, but I also know that you have to have within a, a, a school, you gotta have some kind of rules and there's gotta be some kind of consequences. Because if you don't have that, then it's very difficult to run a school. The, the mm -hmm. problem becomes when the consequences are unfairly applied or when, 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 when what happens is some kids will get, uh, you know, you shouldn't do that and some kids will get suspended. And so the question becomes how people are treated because of race within the confines of a school system. Yeah. But that when we start talking about a, the, 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 the prison, I mean, the school of prison pipeline, we got to talk about much more than just suspensions and expulsions. And I think you have to dig deeper into the educational attainment of the students, which is a real factor in that happening. And Dr. Fuller, there is a reason why we wanted to talk to you because uh, you have such a great uh, perspective on all of the things that uh, are of concern. And so when we look at the institution of racism, um, would you say when it comes to the educational system as we've talked about, do you feel like it's just the, the setup of things or do you think that there are educators who may have to reconfigure their mentality when teaching children who come from all different backgrounds? I think it's both. I mean, I think I think the reality of it is that you have people out there who are teaching children who frankly shouldn't be teaching anybody's children, let alone our children. But you also have excellent teachers. And I want to be real clear about that. Yeah. You have excellent teachers in the Milwaukee public school system. You have excellent teachers in charters. You know, you, you have excellent teachers throughout the system. People who are out there doing, in my opinion, heroic work every single day. Now, some of those people who are doing that heroic work don't necessarily have the tools that they need in order to be effective with the kids that they're teaching. There are other people out there teaching who are who are essentially racist. Mm -hmm. And you really can have all the in-service you want, but you can't in-service someone who is racist. You can provide information to people who are not doing as well as they should because they don't understand, but they're willing and they want to understand. That's a different situation than people who fundamentally believe that black or brown children are not capable of learning at high levels. And, and Andre, you, you know from all the interviews you've done over all the years, if you were to ask a teacher, well, do you think that kids can learn? Oh yes, of course I believe children can learn. But then you ask the second question, well, can they all take algebra? You start asking the second level of question. And then that's when you begin to find out 
who actually believes the real deal, who actually thinks kids can learn, or, or people who think, well, these kids can only learn to a certain level. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's digging into that, which becomes crucial because that's the determination of who you can work with to improve and who you really need to get out because there, there, there's no amount of work that you can do with them that's gonna make them better able or more willing to teach uh, poor children of color. Wow, thank you so very much for your insight today. And as always, it's a pleasure talking to you. Well, I really appreciate it. It was good to see you always. Thank you. You as well. Dr. Howard Fuller's career includes many years in both public service positions and the field of education. And you can read his autobiography, No Struggle, No Progress, to get a better understanding of the man, the educator, activist, and educational reformer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Up next, we welcome UW-Milwaukee's Dr. Mark Levine for a conversation about how systemic racism and Milwaukee's economic disparities have led to one of the highest incarceration rates in the country. That's right after this. <music>